Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joe Crowley. Welcome to the Quilter Cheviot Theatre for our final session of the day. Um, this is about health, well-being and horticulture. And uh, Alistair's going to talk to us and there may be a time for a quick few questions and a bit of discussion as well. Um, hands up, how many of you would consider yourselves gardeners? A few, a few, a few. That's something he might want to boost. So maybe we're going to uh, check at the end and see if we can get a few more of you to declare yourselves as gardeners. We'll see. Um, we've all seen plenty of headlines at one time or another about our health issues, about, I don't know, obesity or, or mental health problems. What you don't see many headlines about is the fact that gardening and green space can actually bolster our physical and our mental health. And here to tell us more about that is um, the Royal Horticultural Society's Head of Science and Collection. Please welcome Dr. Alistair Griffiths. Um, welcome everyone, and, and I'm the Director of Science for the Royal Horticultural Society. And what I wanted to talk to you here is around um, the whole thing around horticulture and health and well-being. Um, because horticulture can help in relation to, to those aspects. But we do have some challenges. And the, one of the challenges is this philosophical challenge called plant blindness. Now, plant blindness is defined as sort of the inability to, to sort of see or notice plants. And therefore, they're inferior. So as you're walking along the street, um, the majority of you here are probably uh, very keen or, or interested in gardening or, or know plants. You get, to, you get to see them and know them. But as they're inferior, it means we don't look after them or sustain them. And that can be a real challenge um, for the whole of the society. If I was to tell you that three quarters of UK children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates, that's quite shocking and that 15-year-olds spend seven and a half hours on their screens. So if they're disconnected that much with nature, how are we to expect them to realise that nature is good for you or that you engage with, with that nature? Also, children 11 to 15 years old spend, spend you know, a lot of time that are indoors rather than out. So does anyone know what that bird is up there? Shout out, anyone? Magpie. So it's a bit shocking that 30% of children can't identify a magpie, um, but 90% can recognise a Dalek. So this disconnection with nature, and there is, there is science behind linked to this disconnection in nature, has some quite fundamental negative um, um, issues, such as we have this view that we are superior to plants and horticulture and we have less empathy for other species, which means we won't conserve them in relation to sustaining us. Now, if you see, there's a graph uh, on, on these sheets here, and basically what it shows is that there's an increase. So as you get from uh, one, one kilometre away from green space, you get um, an increase in the occurrence of diseases. So you get an increase of, of incidence, so a lower incidence if you're closer to green space, of 15 of the 24 diseases that you have. And this includes heart disease, it includes quite a number of different diseases, obesity. So green space is actually quite key for us. Um, another study has shown that high blood pressure in pregnant women is increased by 14% for every 300 metres away from green space. And the baby's head size and, and weight, and the head size is indicative of uh, cognition, of thinking, um, is larger within 500 metres of green space. So we are in a situation where we need to think about, do we need to save ourselves from extinction? We're animals too. And I think a lot of people forget that. Animals are very habitat dependent. And... Therefore, should we not give more consideration to our habitats? Because in effect, people and green are linked to that preventative natural health care. The more green space we have and the more evidence that is, is coming through is showing that green space is beneficial. 
And here's the accumulating evidence. So in, uh, this is a Google Scholar search that says green space and health, and there's seven, over 7,000 papers now that talk about that green space is good for our health and well-being. So the King's Fund also published just recently a paper on gardening on health and a report on health which says overwhelmingly there is, there is um, uh, good evidence around health, well-being and green space, gardening and horticulture. Again, there's a picture of a hospital bed here. This was started off in the 80s where a scientist called Roger Ulrich, basically what he did, he did an experiment where he put uh, patients in, uh, in a room with, with viewing of uh, green space and those without. And he measured the differences between those two. And what did he find? Well, he found that, first of all, the ones, the ones that had the view of nature got out of hospital quicker. Um, they used less me pain medication and they were less grumpier to the nurses. So, you know, there's a real, uh, again, indication around, around the nature and linked to that. But the challenge is, and I suppose in some ways I'm, I'm, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here a little bit, is how do we reconnect people with nature? How do we get them back and engaged? And I think horticulture and gardening has, has fed the world. Okay, it's had a little help from agriculture, but it can act as a catalyst to bring humans back to the natural world, which is really key because there are some massive challenges that we face in society, but there are solutions. So if you take mental health, for example, one in four people are suffering from mental health uh, each year. Big, big challenge. Half mental health problems are established by the age of 14. But what we do know is that, oh, and it costs 105 billion a year to the UK government. What we do know is that horticulture and gardening can improve recovery, anxiety, depression and stress. We know there's evidence that it improves emotional and cognitive well-being. And we know that it improves self-awareness, self-esteem. Um, it does a lot of positive effects and benefits. Physical health. So the WHO worldwide, since 1980, um, 15 million people have global deaths in 2015. Obesity doubled since 1980. Big, big challenge. Horticulture and gardening can help. There was a study that showed... So what they did is they got um, 158 community gardeners, and they, this was in the USA, and they um, measured them against their brothers, their sisters, so brother to brother, sister to sister, neighbours in the same street, and what they found in each case, in the case of the brother compared to brother, sister compared to sister, neighbour compared to neighbour, gardening versus non-community gardening, that the, the community gardeners had less BMI than the, the non-community gardeners. So gardening is good for our health. It also enhances that physical um, and that, that, that performance and mobility. Um, there's an image there you can see with, um, with the, the, the skeleton. It's a piece of research that we're doing with the RHS. And we're looking at using um, uh, technology to see how we can dig better for health so, and looking at the pressure of muscles linked to that. So how we do gardening could be looked at into improving. Um, falls and fractures are a big issue for the elderly. And as we're getting an increasing population, how many of the elderly, when they're weeding in a garden, are constantly up and down? So have the ability to actually get up when they, when they fall. So you're strengthening through gardening. And then parks and gardens and leisure and green space. There's been work where they've used satellites and accelerometers, which attach to people that can show the speed of them, showing differences between those living near parks and gardens uh, compared to those without that green space. I mean, it is common sense, but, but we do have to bring back this green because of the issue of plant blindness and nature deficit disorder. So... This um, graph here shows um, from Harvard University the number of calories burned in 30 minutes activity. And you can see that digging and walking and general gardening, you can get, you know, um, at different weights, you can get up to sort of 200, 225 calories um, per, per 30 minute activities. So actually, I don't want to turn it into a physical exercise or, or a gym, but people pay to go to the gym. They pay a lot of money. Just get out in your garden or get a little pot and start planting up because you can do physical activity, but you also benefit from it. Now, there is a major challenge around social health and well-being, and it's been shown, uh, again, scientifically that, uh, and socially that the less and less people you have around you 
uh, unfortunately, the more likelihood you have in, of increase of death. Gardening is, is a really good tool to bring people together. Um, there is an increasing ageing and isolated population. We need to reconnect people back to each other as well as to uh, green space. And there is a lack of green space linked to these. They're third places that people can, can bring together. So horticulture and gardening can foster social relationships. So for example, we have the RHS supports Bloom, which has 300,000 uh, people across the UK who are actually just creating amazing places. Plants, people, places are really key um, around this. It reconnects isolated people and it reconnects all people from all walks of life. So you can have the most wealthiest people and the most deprived people um, and, and you can get them excited by daffodils and they'll be talking for hours about a particular bulb of daffodil that they want to grow and, and get inspired. It's a real connector. And, and it helps to improve a sense of pride and place. So much so, there's been links in the USA that has shown that there has been reduced crime. So if you look at this graph, this is basically a study by Q and Sullivan uh, in 2001. And what it shows is the amount of vegetation around uh, a housing area. And it shows low, medium and high. And what you can see is at the low, the total crimes are much higher than the high in relation to vegetation. And the reason is, is because people have a sense of place if they've grown that space, which means they look after it and they look after their people. Now, there are other, other areas where people have invested money in areas, cleaned them up, and had very similar uh, results. Another challenge, air pollution. 40,000 deaths each year attributed to exposure to outdoor air pollution in this country. We've got a big issue linked to this, and it's costing, again, 20 billion every year. Yet horticulture can improve the air quality with vegetation. A recent study just in 2017 has shown there are decreases by using plants in certain ways in our streets and cities. You can, you can deal with that. One medium, that's one of my scientists I was talking about, what am I going to talk about in this talk? What am I going to talk about in the vegetation? They said, well, how about this? And they said, one medium-sized shrub captures 30 diesel cars worth of particulate pollution every year. Can you imagine if you had your gardens all greened up, that each of those linked to that? So this is what some of the research we're doing, is looking at how we can improve some of these issues. Green walls have shown uh, through modelling to have a 6 to 40% reduction in NOx gases, which is one of the main uh, pollutants that link to that. And the key thing here is there are 391,000 vascular plants in the wild in the world, but in this country there are 400,000 different cultivated plants. And we have been doing some work looking at this plant against that plant, and that one captures more particulate pollution than that one. So why don't we use that? Why are we not using what agriculture has done for many years with animals, with plants? At the moment, it's just prettiness in the main. But they can do far more for us as, as human beings, as they have done in agriculture. But the ornamental plants can do more. So flooding. Five million people at risk of flooding. Uh, people are paving over their front gardens uh, quite rapidly. And uh, Storm Desmond, so just one storm, cost more than five billion. Again, um, there's two pictures here, one, one with trees and one with just grey space. What you have is issues with um, surface water runoff. As it rains intensely, the water goes onto the concrete, it runs off, it goes into the sewers, and if there's extreme runoff, it will then uh, open the sewers and then lots of sewage will go in the works. For the water companies, it makes their pumps work harder. You get flooding, all those kind of things. If you have green space and if you have trees and shrubs and stuff, first of all, you've got the tree, so water rains stopped by the tree. Then you have soil, because you haven't got concrete, the water stops by the soil. Then you have roots deep down and the water stops by the roots. The tree is also quite clever in that it's taking the water up to grow and releasing it back into the atmosphere. And therefore, you lose all this sort of water a lot more than you would do in relation to just paving over. But again, different trees will take up different amounts. So it captures rain. We can slow down the runoff, um, hold more water, and it transpires through. So one of my scientists, again, uh, Tiana Belnuza, did some work here. And this graph just shows you. You can see there's different, different uh, trees there. The Crotagus, which is actually hawthorn, showed no percentage runoff as compared to um, 
just normal, normal soil. So you can see that different plants do different amounts of protection against flood. And I think we need to do more research, and we are looking at more research, to look at how we plant. Men maintain the beauty of gardening and gardens, because we're a nation of gardens, but use the plants in a much more uh, sophisticated way. Noise pollution. Big, big issue in cities and in towns. Different plants. So we've got two plants here. Fatinia, uh, which is a lovely shrub, deals with high frequencies. So a study showed high frequencies, and that deals with electrical equipment. And then you've got uh, cedar, which you could turn into hedges in, so, in some instances, low frequencies. So that deals with traffic noise. So again, the way you plant, you could help to do noise reduction. And, and I think you know, there's stuff like also garden features. So there was a paper on uh, uh, different types of water features, fountains, streams. And what they showed was that if you got the exact same level of noise on your water feature as the traffic, or three decibels below, the traffic will get masked out. So again, you know, if you want a solution to deal with noise pollution in your garden, don't invest in lots of buffering and fences and stuff. Think about plants, use plants, and, and think about features that can mask it out. Use technology uh, and thinking around how we use these plants. And if you want to save, um, save on your fuel bin bills, get more climbers growing up your wall or have green, green walls because we did some work at Reading University with the RHS and the blocks here, you can see the cubes. There's a picture of a block there showing the, the heat because inside we heated it. We covered it with vegetation. And what we found is that plants can help. Uh, so if you have a plant up, a, up a, a building, what it can do is it can help to cool during the uh, summer but also help to insulate during the winter. And, and the cuboids that we used, it showed that the energy used, depending on your building type and depending on the plants you use, was reduced between 17 and 45% of using, of using green, walls, green wall structures. So again, there are lots and lots of climbers uh, that can be used to link to that. If we look at wildlife, biodiversity is decreasing uh, phenomenally. Um, and particular natural habitats, and we must protect and look after those natural habitats. But we've also got this 400,000 uh, plants that are cultivated plants. So we discovered roughly, um, in 2016, 1,730 new plants were discovered in the world. In 2016, that same year, just for orchids, 3,000 new orchids were created by people. And, and those 3,000 orchids could be used, and those other new plants that have been discovered in the wild could be used for many of these things that I'm talking about. But if you look at wildlife, so there's two different cultivars. We call them cultivars because they're slightly different. In some instances, this is one is pink and one is white. But what it shows is that the, the pink one had 15 visits per meter squared per hour of pollinators. The white one didn't have any visits. So the way that you plant your gardens means that you can encourage or discourage uh, pollinators from there. So you can help with the biodiversity. So there's some really key questions. And, and for me, it's about, um, you know, the NHS is, is on the brink of, uh, of, of, of challenging. We're always thinking the solution is more nurses, more doctors. But we should think, like in any kind of disease model, prevention is better than cure. And how can we prevent better? Well, we can look at how we can use gardening and horticulture as a catalyst to help that. I'm not saying it's the silver bullet. With pollution, of course it's source. We must remove the diesel engines and stuff. But we can also use vegetation to help as part of that solution, as part of many solutions. But what plants and landscapes do we plant to maximise, as we're walking in a city, that help with our mental health, that help with our obesity, that help with all these issues that I've talked about? So a study was done there, and there's a, there's a graph here uh, that, again, anything um, sort of, if you're looking at it this way, anything that side of the line is uh, perceived restorative wellness. Now, restorative wellness is, I feel much better around this. And the one at the bottom, the green one, is, an Al, is called Alnap Garden, which was a specific garden designed for health and well-being. Now, the key outcome of this research showed, and it's by the Swedish Agricultural Centre, showed that natural environments heal the most. Yet Alnarp Garden beat, 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 beat tropical forests, beach forests, savannah, river. So you can design, we can landscape in 
gardens that create more wellness than a tropical rainforest in our cities, if we think clever about this, which could stop, in part, this issue to do with uh, the health service. So I have, and, and certainly a number of us that are really interested in the role of using horticulture and using gardening, because 50% of the UK actually garden in this country. There are 22 million gardens in this country, and we spend roughly 5 billion each year on gardening in this country. Um, the questions I want to sort of ask is, first of all, how do we tackle this philosophical challenge of nature deficit disorder and this plant blindness? How do we reverse that without being preachy or, 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 or you know, shoving it down people's throats? How do we engage and inspire people to get excited about this, this really um, good opportunity? How much green space do we need? Is it 10%? Is it 50%? Is it 70% in order to maximise on, on that health and well-being, in order to help to reduce obesity and help to reduce... Uh, what types of plants, gardens and green space will maximise that? So how, how do we pull together those landscapes like the Arnap Garden to maximise on that? And how best do we cultivate those plants and interact with those plants and garden with them so that we actually um, engage and, and, and link with that to maximise on that health and well-being. So, one of the things that um, someone who I really, really like, uh, who's not longer with us, but um, was very visionary thinking, uh, it was called Sir Patrick Geddes, and he said, how many people think twice about a leaf? Yet the leaf is the chief product and phenomenon of life. By leaves we live. And I think he was genius. He was a planner as well as a botanist. And he saw that no matter what, you know, no matter what we use in this world, it's either mined or grown. And therefore, we need to look back. We need to help to re-engage people with the wonders of nature and plants. And... Um, get them inspired to do that. And I think Patrick Geddes, for me, is just is absolutely brilliant how, how he did that. Now, what can you do then? So, at home, green instead of grey. Now, a lot of you may already be green in any way, but do more of it. Um, my wife's just there at the moment. She is really cross that every time I come in, I have a plant and I'm doing this, bringing in, it's another plant coming in, sorry. Uh, hedge instead of fence. Plant with habitat in mind, including your own habitat. Because it is your own habitat that you're creating. And if you create a good habitat for you, you will also help to create a good habitat for the rest of biodiversity. And you'll reconnect people back so that they, are, they care about saving the rhino or they care about saving the orangutan. People are really disconnected from nature. At large, spread the word. What I've told you today... Please tell as many people as possible. Tell them that there is an absolutely causal link between health, improvement of health, a prevention stuff linked to gardening and horticulture. There is absolutely evidence there linked to it. There's seven, over 7,000 papers that tie that into it. Encourage green instead of grey. Don't, don't um, patronise people, but inspire them, help them. If people come into, and if anyone's in the garden club, don't undermine them, don't um, think they're stupid. Just any kind of growing is really, really important. Connect them in, get them to grow. And inspire more people to re uh, reconnect with nature. When I was the age of four, the biggest connection of nature was me. I remember first sitting down, seeing a frog, and just being absolutely in awe. There was a moment of just absolute excitement about seeing this natural world and there are lots of little trigger moments of natural world that I think we can share with other people and particularly our children and adults that we can get people inspired um, with that now on your um, what, what is this plant anyone rosemary how many rosemary's do you think we have growing in this country cultivated rosemary. 20 million. Steady on. <laughs> well, we don't have one. We have, we, have, we have one or two that are in supermarkets, which, by the way, we don't know what it is. But we, at, at the RHS trials at Wisley, we have 84 different types of rosemary. Anyone know what rosemary does? 
goes well with lamb, antibacterial. It's, it's also uh, recognized as E392 as a, a preservative for meats and foods, uh, as an antioxidant. It's an antibacterial, it improves carcinogenic, it's perfume, it's uh, food, flavoring, antioxidant, it does a huge number of things. So again, even with a simple rosemary, I'm still learning, I don't know what the antioxidants are within that, we know that some of them are, are good and bad, we've got 84 of them, we can look at those. Have we got high enough antioxidants in the ones that we've got on our supermarket shelves? I don't know. Have we got, um, you know, this is an ornamental plant as well. But the connection of plants is that at least it's a rosemary. And how deep you go and how more you know about it, the better we understand these plants. And the other thing is, if you smell this, there was a paper that was just recently done where uh, children were asked to smell before doing an exam and they did better. Now, I'm a bit dubious about some of that kind of stuff, but absolutely there is evidence around improving memory, which is why I've all given you lavender, because what I want you to do is to try to remember at least a few snippets of what I've done. But equally, this lavender was... Uh, I went and bought this from Jekka, and Jekka McVicker is one of the most amazing herb growers in this country. Uh, this, and this is Jekka's up right. So, put it in a little bag if you've got a bag, take it home, grow it. It's from my garden via Jekka, one of the best herb growers in this country or just cook it up, just do something with it, use it. Or if you want, just smell it once and toss it away. That's it's fine, as long as it's uh, tossed away in a bin. <laughs> Bye. Um, that's it, that's me. Thanks very much. Yeah, huge thanks to Alistair there. Um, if anyone's got any questions, we've got a, a, a moment if, if you want to ask any now. I don't know if anyone's got anything. Yes, uh, down here, we, we'll get a microphone to you, so it's just coming around. I'll be sniffing my rosemary while I wait, yeah. Um, Hello, uh, can you just explain what an Alnarp garden is, please? Yeah, so this is the, this came, the Alnarp came top of the list in terms yeah. of well-being. So, so Alnarp was a garden that was uh, from, is in Sweden. It's the Swedish Agricultural Centre of, of Science. If you type in Alnarp Garden Google, and it's a specific garden that was designed not only for looking at health and well-being, so different areas of spaces. So, for example, the sort of principles of design. So water features are absolutely key. Um, places to sit, shade and light is absolutely key. But also what they do, and I think what is important, is it's the landscape plus the activities. So they do something called social and therapeutic horticulture in there, whereby what they do is they have people that come in, and it's a form of counselling, where they take different individuals on journeys. And there's, again, lots of evidence around things on uh, post-traumatic, recovery from post-traumatic stress disorder, recovery from cancer, uh, and, and, and through gardening, or recovery from depression. So that's, does that answer you? Yeah, but have a look, because it's, yeah, it's a really cool garden. Um, there seems to be, I mean, we're talking about disconnect a lot, the, the, the evidence is fantastic. I mean, you, you cite so much of it, and there's so, you know, so many good studies. Who takes a lead? I mean, w do we wait for government in the end? Or, you know, I know there's all these individual things people yeah. can do, but there needs to be a massive shift here. We're yeah. building on green spaces in cities. You know, how do we start to not just improve things, but stop all the damage that's being done? And I, I, you're absolutely right. And I, and I think for the past three years, I've been uh, lobbying and speaking to government. The, the RHS and the horticultural industry uh, are sitting on an ornamental horticultural roundtable group, which is directly linked to George Eustace. And um, we're having conversations there about, look, this is really important. We've got it into, although the 25-year environmental plan hasn't been published yet, we've pushed it into that to say, look, this is critical, this is important. But the government aren't going to it's not going to happen with just the government, so it needs to happen grassroots up and high down. And so anyone that listens to me, I will chat to them about it. And, and you know, so for example, we, we had a, a meeting of 150 people at Hampton Court uh, Chelsea Flower Show, we've got the Health and Horticultural Forum group, and I'm constantly getting emails to me. Um, Jekka, for example, said, oh, I've done a hospital garden in Bristol, I've just done one for soldiers, and I've just done one for there. So it is happening, I think we just have to keep doing it, and everyone can make a difference. I think that's it. The only way we're going to move this is to... I think we've got to the point where people aren't thinking it's mad, and it's in yeah. a hippie world. Yeah. I think the science is there now, I think we've moved that step. The, the frustration is around linking that in. The other key thing is economics. So iTree, I don't know where you're aware of that, but what they've done is they've measured uh, the benefit of trees and shown there is a financial benefit. So we're also looking at the financial benefits, particularly around removal from healthcare and things like that. So I think more of that happening, but yeah, I think it's just pushing that. 
So it's individual lobbying as well, because everyone here, I'm sure we can all, as you say, you're preaching to the converted, but we can, we can not tarmac our front gardens or yeah. whatever it is, but it's actually also sort of lobbying and standing up for well, the community it's, it's, and, it's, and encouraging these I mean, also going, going to your, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be talking to the Horticultural Trade Association, which is all the garden centres. Um, talk to your garden centres and ask them for shrubs that are good for pollution. Because yeah. until there's a demand for that stuff, they go, oh, well, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not important. Or I want some shrubs that will do noise pollution. It means we'll have to work a bit quicker on the research <laughs> and stuff. But I think if you ask for that, the demand, it will come from a customer demand. Yeah. Um, and more ideas about that on the RHS website? Can people read it? Certainly, more? well, one of the big things I would ask you to do is uh, we've got a campaign called Greening Grey Britain. So uh, if you do any kind of greening, pledge, uh, do a bit of Greening Grey Britain on there. And we're trying to get about 6,000. Uh, people to turn one metre squared back into green. So yeah, yeah, do that. And a blatant plug for me, we've just done a one-show film on that actually, so that'll be coming out soon. We've just greened a grey courtyard in Swansea Brilliant. with a primary school, so that's one to look out for. Hopefully inspire you. Um, I think we have to end it there unless anyone's got a, another burning... Oh yes, one more question then from this lady. Um, I am an old hippie actually, I'm also a mental health worker. I wondered if we could convince our GPs to give plants instead of peels because a lot of the people I go to don't grow their own food. I myself live in, I've come from a big house to a small flat but yeah. I can still do a lot on my small patio or on my windowsill. Absolutely. Uh, you could do sprouting. A lot of people really would benefit from actually yeah. nurturing that, reconnecting back with where their food came from anyway. Yeah and um, it would give them a sense of purpose in many ways to actually grow their own food and make themselves better that way. Yeah. Obviously, there's bigger schemes that you've talked about, and, or they could, if they haven't got their own space in their own area, they could connect up with um, the, some of the projects um, where you can grow food for other people. Yeah. Um, which there's, there's plenty of those all around there's, the country. There's a huge, absolutely, and I'm, I'll, I'll let you into a secret. I'm a scientist, but a secret hippie. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there are, like you said, I'm a trustee of something called People and Gardens. There are about 13 people, physical, emotional uh, impairment. I've seen people transformed from uh, doing this to, Ali, Ali, give me a fiver and I'll wash your car. And it was the plants, it was the people and the places that connected together. There are huge numbers of community groups out there. There are also about 10 GPs in this country now that are prescribing uh, that element of garden. We need more of that. I mean, Tower Hamlets is probably one of the best ones where Tower Hamlets has GPs uh, and the depressed people are producing the veg, which the veggies then go into the hospitals for the hospital patients to eat. It's a fantastic model, but they're still struggling for, for money, for support to do that because it's a long-term um, win. Change, isn't it? I mean, I helped start one of the incredible edicles locally, yeah. which is growing, we grow food and people come and take it for free. Yeah. People just can't get their head around that. Yeah. You know, how, are you, how can we just take it? They, yeah. they think they have to pay for it or what? And it's a mindset change, it is. really. That's what we need. And it's also understanding what plants are because some children don't think tomatoes are still underground and things like that. So there's still... A bit of that. But Incredible Edible is incredible. And I think it is about that. It's, so it's grassroots up. But equally, we can't stop at the high level to make some of these bigger things peel down and pull up. It's a, yeah, it's a spread. Great. Well, once again, a huge thank you to Dr. Alistair Griffiths. Cool. Um, lots of great tips there. Lots of ideas. I hope that's inspired you to go away and keep greening or, or start greening your little patch of Great Britain, maybe. Uh, and thanks, as ever, to Court Achieve It. has been another great day. Thank you to them for sponsoring this theatre, putting it together. Uh, I hope you've had a lovely day here at Country Far Live, and we'll see you again. Thank you. <laughs>